Welcome to the Shape Free Zone. I'm really excited about today. We're going to be talking about uh, burlesque and trauma and consent. Oh my God, you know, I realize <laughs> that doesn't seem like those topics may necessarily intersect, but my guest today is going to show us how they do. Her name is Kalita Malouf. Kalita, welcome to the Shame Free Zone. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. I'm really happy to be here. You've got a really impressive bio, and I confess it's rather <laughs> expensive, so I didn't try to memorize it. I'm no, just, please, no. Put on my reading glasses here <laughs> and uh, deliver the news to our viewers. Alrighty. Kalita Malouf is a performing and teaching artist, a soulful mentor, and a conscious burlesque coach. She works at the intersection where burlesque dance meets depth psychology, meets attachment theory, meets individuation, meets autoimmune recovery, meets spirituality. Wow, you are like my soul sister here. I, <laughs> I, I love connecting all kinds of disparate concepts. You too. For over 20 years, she's performed, designed, and curated shows and events all over the world from San Francisco to New Orleans, to Hollywood, to Montreal, and Paris, and Tokyo. And highlights in her career include founding the award-winning troupe Hot Pink Feathers, first place in original world fusion dance and choreography in Carnival San Francisco. She was also queen of Carnival <laughs> San Francisco in 2008. Mm -hmm. And she was featured in Margaret Cho's Sensuous Woman Show. Oh my God, I love, I love Margaret. Margaret Cho. I love Margaret Cho. Yeah. And you're a five-time finalist at the Burlesque Hall of Fame. I don't think it gets any better than this. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Veronica. <laughs> and, and so, you know, because that's all of that's just not enough for you. Uh, you also help others who've been over-editing, over-managing, and over-giving and are attracted to dance, theater, and performance to trust themselves and express themselves with confidence, presence, presence and radiance, which I think dance is such an important part of that. Uh, and you integrate your work, apparently, into a practice that is, uses transformative modality. So we're going to talk about this some more, but that includes EFT. Yep. Uh, is that emotional freedom technique? It is. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Marin style NLP, which is neuro linguistic programming. Yep. Systemic constellations, interpersonal neurobiology, and the fourfold way. Uh, you're going to have to explain that one to no me. No problem. That's yeah. one I haven't heard of. That's okay. Kalita's mission is to support women in dusting off the foundation of self love that was hiding right in the center of their very own shimmy. I'm sure you're going to tell us a little bit about what a shimmy is. <laughs> and you've got a book, How to Create a Burlesque Solo from the Inside Out. Never, ever, ever show a disembodied boob. Yeah, you read <laughs> that right. A, that's quite a subtitle. Yes, it is. <laughs> and it's, it's coming out this month. This month. I just, just got off Zoom with the cover designer. Oh, my and God. I, yeah, I mean, it actually might be done next week. That's Congratulations. Just... Thank you. Yes. yes. Now, is this your first book? Yeah, it is. How it exciting. Is. Yeah. How exciting. It's a okay. guidebook. It's very, it takes you, I share all my secrets of this is how you create a burlesque solo from the inside out in 13 steps. Wow, 13 steps. I like that. Yep. Um, I'm in a 12-step program, so the 13th step is inappropriate. But anyway, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Something tells me though, you're kind of a racy gal. Um, <laughs> you know, it's so funny. I'm, I, I mean, look at this face. I actually am, uh, my byline, my byline in many people have a, a tagline for their, in, when they're doing their burlesque um, art. Uh, actually, Kalita is my stage name, just Kalita alone. Yes. But my most recent tagline is, the Mr. Rogers of burlesque. So if that tells you anything, I actually have a deep, <laughs> I have a deep wholesomeness that exists in me all throughout my burlesque soloing and my whole career. It's, um, it is, uh, I actually, oh, wow. yeah, yeah. So, so that's really cool. And that's kind of almost opposite of me. It seems like I can't even, um, hoe my garden without some sensuality oozing out. So <laughs> 
know. I, for me, sensuality, sensuality yeah. is just aliveness, aliveness in our senses. Mm-hmm. I, I refer to it as reveling. It's one of the three R's of showgirl awakening, which is the cosmology behind everything that I do, the act creation, the living in radiance. Yeah. Okay. So then you have to tell us what those three R's are. Sure. Easy. Okay. Um, reveling in the body. Mm. Yeah. I know you see you're already doing it you're already <laughs> your chimney amazing I, mean, I have a shimmy, <laughs> your shimmy you're, do, you're doing a form of shimmy right shimmy. there yeah, you just yeah we'll, we might there revisit shimmy yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and our number two is revealing your radiant essence ah uh, yeah and okay. the third one which oh the holy grail my goodness I'm still really working on this one receiving what you truly desire receiving that's so Thank hard you. for so many women it is Darn it. We just, we've got this genetic legacy. It's like embedded in our DNA. Give, give, give. It's so. in, in sneaky ways too. Oh, in yes. very, very sneaky ways. Like some are obvious and, uh, and some are just uh, like, hang on a second. Whose will what did I check in with when I made that last decision? Oh. Or did I even make a decision? I saw I just didn't say no, did I? Oh my God. Yes. So for me, I have found that I, I have a lot of codependent traits and thank you, mom um, <laughs> and grandma and yeah. probably all the women that came before her. Yeah. But, uh, and I work, I've been working on my codependent patterns for so long. Me too. <laughs> <sighs> it feels like a lifelong job. And every time I pull another layer off, there's, there's something else. But so Kalita, I use a codependent uh, trick what to is try to get my codependency to stop being codependent. Oh no, you I, meddle yourself. I, I do. I, I tell myself, um, be good to yourself and practice self-love because you'll be better at serving others. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, that one, as long as, it, as long as it's really coming from your full cup, it's okay if you use that little trick. Oh, thanks. Okay. Thank you. I was so guilty about so. it. No, no, it's okay. As long as you don't skip the step of, it has to be a genuine, a genuinely um, self-refilling full cup. Yes. And when you're there, we can do whatever we want with our surplus. Right? We can serve, we can serve the crap out of everybody if we, <laughs> if we want to, as long as it's not, um, you know, uh, coming from an empty barrel. That's yeah. true. Or a place of trying to control or manipulate. Or trying to control or manipulate us. <laughs> you said that's, it. That's it's a hard different. one for me to give up. That's but a hard one for me to give up too. You just mentioned something that I, I know points back to, I think it's a one woman show that you have about yeah. consent. Yes. And yes. You, you actually call that I know, but so you spell out the word N O uh, N I'm sorry. K N O W, so like yes. I know something. Yes. And, and then in you bracket the N O for the no. Yes, yes. Yeah. So it's really saying two things like I know with my noggin and I know, like no, yes, no as a verb. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I, that's I've a- always said that if you don't have a firm no, your yes is meaningless. So yeah. I am so excited to hear and and I'm, I'm writing a book on consent. So yeah. I'm excited, excited yeah. to hear what you have to share with us um, about this concept. I am going to do my best. The reason that I created the One Woman Show, which we'll link to below this interview, yeah. um, is because it really needed, a, honest, honestly, it was through, through the creation of the show, I used the creating of the show to help me articulate what had been unarticulatable for most of my life. Right. I, you know, like you, I've done a lot of personal growth, <laughs> decades and decades of high quality. Really okay. Decades high quality. and decades, but let's not start, let's not get too carried away with those things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not shy about my age. I'll, I'll share it if you ask me. Well, good for you. <laughs> um, I'll be 53 in one month. One oh, month you today. look fabulous. You look fabulous. <laughs> so, um, and happy um, birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Scorpio? Are you a Scorpio? No, I'm a Libra. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. This, 
All right, Libra, tell yeah. us about consent. And what so, did you learn about saying no? And th this, the I know is more, it's, it's gen life wide. So it's not related yeah. just to um, in the bedroom or that it's, it's the, my, so I'm going to, I'm going to go back to the beginning. Okay. Oh, or, this is, this is a hard one to enter. This is again, why I created a whole, I, fi I find that I think every family has a trance, first of all. We all have, it's a slightly different variety, but there is a genuine trance and it has the fingerprints of that family. You already referred to generation. Um, right. Generational patterns being passed down. That's a nice neutral way to say it. Generational yeah. patterns. <laughs> and how, when I'm in the trance that, um, that came to me from just being a member of my family line, when I'm in that trance, I can't see even, even the wonderful, the wonderful sweetness that looks and feels like connection. Uh, I'm trying to say this in the sweetest way, but is actually a, um, uh, an invasion of my whole person. So it looks like love and there's love in it. This is the tricky thing, right? There's love in it, but it's a distorted, it's a distorted kind of contorted love that and it usually comes from a caregiver, primary caregiver that um, I, I did not know where I stopped and my mother started for the longest time. I could not, could not, I didn't even know that I didn't know for a long time. And then I just had a sense, oh, there's something here. You might, I might now call it like some kind of symbiosis or I, and I couldn't see out of it until I was actually out of it. And I still, I dip in and I go in back and forth, yeah. but there are, I can't even tell you in a short way, there's funny anecdotes in, in the one woman show that, that share different ways that that came out. And also how um, I developed, this is, I very much attribute, attribute a autoimmune illness, which is an inflammation in my intestines to my inability to say no outside. I just said no really loud inside my body. The no will go somewhere. My body's aware that it has a boundary. There is a membrane that is too permeable. And if I don't catch it with my words and my thoughts, it goes inside. And so as I, as I find my edge, as I truly genuinely individuate, not in a form of adolescent rebellion, like I'm not my family, I that's a stage. I'm just talking about the actual clear, oh my gosh, oh, past this point is not acceptable. <gasps> a conversation about that in this context? Um, no, actually I'm opting out. <laughs> oh, I, oh, you mean healthy boundaries healthy boundaries healthy boundaries <laughs> as i yeah as i develop those my body on the inside yeah. calms down and i actually come into health in my tissue i mean it's that mm -hmm. it's that concrete it's just um so that's as best i could do without sharing the oh whole. i think i think you did beautiful thank it, you it's, <laughs> and 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 I, I like how you're exploring this through the body yeah. because oftentimes it, it seems to me when people are learning about assertion skills and healthy boundaries, it's more cerebral. They're just being told, yeah. you know, say this and do that. No, it's not and, like yeah. and if you, if I think what you're pointing to is so crucial and probably for everybody, but I certainly have seen it a lot in women. Like when I, I work with heterosexual couples, um, I work with all couples, poly couples, queer couples, but I get a lot of heterosexual couples in my practice. And I find that they oftentimes, the man may be a little clearer on what he wants. Yeah. And he may, he may be clueless about what he feels, but he seems to have a pretty good idea what he wants. Yeah. And the woman, a lot of times um, will, maybe know what she's feeling 
but she won't actually know what she wants because it, the, the female culture as I've experienced it, and I'm sorry to say, when I have clients in their 20s, I'm still seeing this. So it's not, I would have hoped it was a generational thing. Just my grandmother, my mother, me. No, it's still going on. Young women in their 20s still don't have the voice yeah. to say what they want. And a lot of times if I ask them, they seem really hard put to even connect with that. So I, I think that's part of what you're pointing to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, How do you, now I, so I know you're helping people to yeah. move that trauma and you use a lot of different modalities. Yeah. So I'd love for us to talk a little bit about trauma and yeah. how it is that you help people get past their trauma. Yeah. In general, people tend to come come work and play with me um, most often because they're they're having this sense that there's another way to feel um, another way to experience themselves being a person in a body that that there is the prospect that they can actually feel deeply and and juicily embodied, like that they actually live in their body and they make choices based on their own feelings. They might not be able to articulate all that, but mm -hmm. as they listen to interviews like this and um, come to, you know, at, hear, hear me talk, they're having a sense that, huh, sometimes they see it if they see me perform. Performance itself, the performing of burlesque solos has been a major gym for me to exercise my muscle of I'm here in my body and then at the next second and I'm here in my body and I'm here in my body and I'm just even more here in my body it's like been my gym yeah and like oh and I'm making choices every second of you get on a very literal level and also on a very metaphysical level you get to see this like you might maybe you get to see my forearm but also do you, how much, uh, this, this is pretty woo, but also true, woo, but true. Woo, but true. I like that. <laughs> woo, but true. I've never said that. That's a fun one. Um, there is a way, I'm, on a very Newtonian level, you either see my skin or you don't see my skin. Yeah? Right. But on a less Newtonian, more quantum level, how much I let you see me, it comes from more of an energetic stance. I can be standing in front of you, but naked and not consenting to you actually seeing who I am. Oh, I've done that many times. Yes, yes I know. Yes, I know. <laughs> it's, it's very, very possible. And it's also possible to be standing in a parka and let yourself be permeable and let the people mm -hmm. who are in front of you see the crap out of you but like see you so i love playing with it you see the skin you don't see the skin but that's not actually the most profound thing that i'm playing with with you i don't mean playing with in a trivial way i mean wow. experimenting with and yeah. this is the thing ah so trump one of the happy byproducts of creating a conscious burlesque solo from the inside out a happy byproduct is, is you start to love your body love parts that you never could you, you did not love before you heal trauma, but mm. we're not coming together with the express. I don't hang the shingle of come here. And, you know, I just, I just show with my, my, the transmission of my body, what is possible because I am my first training ground. I am the primary experiment. And it's because I continue to experiment with being visible in a way that I can not only tolerate, yeah. but actually begin to genuinely enjoy. Even letting you see where I mess up, where I'm not perfect, mm. long covering perfectionist here, okay. um, and finding that place. Yeah, so it's um, it really is a transmission and it's, um, you can see I get very excited about it. <laughs> I, I love what you Very do. excited. <laughs> <laughs> and that one of the main things we play with and practice with is seeing each other. So in the creation of the solo, which we do in small pods of, um, I mostly work with women. I've, I've worked with a couple of men, but primarily 
with women and we practice shifting right you know we have the right brain and the left brain right. our culture our culture is incredibly left shifted like to a fault it's very important to have a healthy left brain to be able to make distinctions and analyze but that right. ah it's so strong that we yeah. need access to our right brain in fact when we're when we're primarily using our left brain we don't even see others as human you, we need our right brain to recognize another person as a human and not a function. Mm. So what we practice together is actually how to see someone as the, the miracle that they are. They don't have to do anything, wear anything, say mm. anything. Do you know the Rumi quote? I, if I really see you, I will either laugh out loud or shatter or break it's a translation anyway into a thousand pieces like oh, seeing right. someone yeah. is just yeah. so that's that's what we're that's what we're after and what we play with in in the creation of a conscious burlesque solo which is one of the main that's my favorite modality all the other modalities are like spices uh-huh you know it really seems like you are offering something that is more than burlesque yeah, it, it's actually uh, maybe a, a universal language we could tap into to kind of heal our polarized times. Yeah, it, <laughs> start it, seeing each other as people. Seeing each other as people. It's true. I just happened to do it in the context of a burlesque solo, but it's completely applicable in any other circumstance. There's so much about being embodied that I think can um, heal us, and 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 it is out of the box and. But, you know, uh, as a sexologist, I give my clients um, uh, sexual homework. Usually it's self-pleasuring homework that is all about healing trauma, grieving loss, uh, connecting to their passion and purpose. and has yeah. very little to do with what we usually would associate with orgasms. Right, um, right. I, I want to ask you, what is drip, drip trauma? <laughs> yeah. So we've, we've been... Most things we've talked about have, have, ha, have been about drip, drip trauma. So I'll say its counterpart, which is boom, boom. Um, okay. These are very evocative. Well, these, are, these, are, these are kind of uh, burlesque terms, I'm guessing. Well, <laughs> thank, thank you for oh, noticing oh. that. No one noticed that. Boom, boom. I love that. Actually, I hadn't made that connection. But yes, so boom, boom trauma is... Um, Usually it's discreet. It's happened. It's very, very clear. Like, for example, like my house burned down on April 2nd, 1992. I'm making this oh. up. But, yeah. Oh, I thought you're making it up. I thought I'm making it up. My, my house almost burned down. So oh, I'm, no. I'm still like really sad for you. Oh, no. I was a sensitive, sensitive one. I might have wanted to pick another. But life is one way. Yeah, in California, we don't want to hear about houses burning. Okay, we, won't, no, we won't say that. And not then, right now. Not right now. But okay, like somebody died. Yes, yes. So then life went, and then someone died and then life was noticeably different and you could track it and yeah. it was that event. That's a boom, boom. Boom, boom. Okay. Boom, boom. Very, okay. very clear. And it's actually, it's actually more straightforward to heal from a boom, boom trauma than it is a drip, drip. Drip, drip, you just see like when drip, drip is when every second of every day, it's not safe to be your authentic self. Oh. Every second of every day. Yeah. And unfortunately, this is true for most people. Just depend, the degree, the degree shifts. Right. The degree shifts, but this is, um, uh, yeah, especially for highly sensitive people, especially for folks who in their original home environment, it, there was not much of a window of welcome for emotion or needs or desires um and we learn to um, narrow down the range of ourselves um drip drip trauma is one of the main reasons that we do that and and that also accounts for the trance because it's constantly being administered and it's it becomes self-administered and like i think in in experiments with maybe rats when they they're, they're taught to 
these crazy things where the, 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 the rat will self-administer the thing that is harmful because of like, almost like a, a Pavlovian um, yeah. training. This is how we are. We self-administer our anesthesia of, to numb us to who we actually are so that we have the hope of belonging with who we love. Yeah. Yeah. But this is how, this is why we practice in little increments. It doesn't have to be the original folks with whom you had the diminishment. No. It can be anybody. It can be a group of people you're creating a burlesque solo with. It can be anybody you draw to you who has the interest and some good guidance of how to see you. So we see each other out of the drip, drip trauma. Ah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I hope I, I, may we all experience the healing of our trauma. Yeah. I really think that the yeah. state that the world is in right now is due so much to oh, yeah. widespread trauma. Yeah, absolutely. And, and unfortunately, it's self-perpetuating. So yeah. if a lot of people who have experienced trauma then go on to perpetrate trauma. Yes. And, and it just keeps happening. And, 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 you know, we probably should clarify for the viewers who maybe don't know, like, what's trauma? Well, trauma sure. is essentially anything that causes you to not be able to speak the truth and show up as fully as who you are. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's big Beautiful traumas sir. and little traumas. Um, there's complex trauma, which is actually what I suffer from because I had an incredibly abusive childhood yeah. and you know, I've ongoingly I've been in some kind of recovery slash therapy for decades. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and, and it requires that if you have complex trauma, it requires quite a bit of, of healing. But there's also the trauma that most people think of, like you went to war or yeah. you were there when the buildings fell yeah. for 9-11 yeah. or um, maybe, you know, your dad used to hit your mom, something like that. Yeah. So those, though, but actually like if your dad used to hit your mom, that's probably going to lead more to complex trauma because it is, it's yeah. repeated exposure. Yeah. If, if you get in a car wreck or somebody robs you, um, it's more boom, boom. It is. And, and so it's, yeah. you can usually like, um, do EMDR or some of these other healing modalities and find a lot of relief. Yeah. Um, yeah, but, but that, drip, that, drip is essentially complex. What you're describing. It is. Yeah. And, and yeah. it's, I, I agree that almost everybody has some level of that. They may yeah. not actually have post-traumatic stress disorder, but they're, they have, um, automatic response of not showing who they really are because yes. it's not it's not safe yeah it's never safe so how is it now how could somebody you you say in quotes perform authenticity uh-huh uh -huh. <clears throat> this is a um i have an issue with the verb to perform it's been so soaked in I mean, to me, just that, that verb alone connotes that I'm doing something that I, I have sussed out is going to please you. Right. And I want another verb because I don't know what, I, I try different ones, but the performance in the context that I'm interested in and that I experiment in is the showing, the showing of the self for the sake of the self. So it's the opposite of that. But what I know time and time again is that when I do that, or when I guide someone else to do that, it's always a jaw drop on the floor, interesting and captivating to others. But when we try to, ooh, when I try to be sexy or funny or whatever my, in whatever way I think is going to please my audience, yeah. I have set myself up for diminishment. It's only when I actually know Oh my gosh, how does it feel to raise this arm up? How does it feel to jazz hand? And I actually check in, in the moment, every second, how does this feel? Uh -huh. Oh, not any more of that? Oh, now a little chest circle. How does that feel? Oh, yum. When, when my point of reference is myself, it is infinitely, infinitely nourishing to, I like to call them my witnesses instead of, or my wittiants. It's that witness audience combination. That's when they get invited to be, to inhabit their own body and not to see me 
as a function that pleases them or not. Because when I'm in my body in front of you, you are invited to be in your body. If I'm disembodied in front of you, you can barely be in your body if you want to. Well, that really happened at the beginning of this interview, didn't it? Tell me. Well, because you were already in your body and you were okay. doing things with your hands. Yeah. Uh, next thing you know, I was kind of waiting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, um, yeah. it's so, cont contagious, but it's an invitation. Yeah. That you, you, your body said, oh, I like that invitation. Yeah, <laughs> I'm totally down with this. <laughs> yeah. Well, wow. So, um, just sexy? How do you relate to the, the concept yeah. of sexy? Yeah. So that's another word that's been so co-opted. And I think, I think what the original, at least what, what I've decided is, um, before it became contorted into the thing that other people want to see from me right. in this way, like this pose and that, this facial expression and right. protruding of the breast, whatever is the setup that we've decided, oh, that's sexy and that's not, um, in our culture, it's, it's become a caricature. It's become a caricature of what, I think, what it may originally, like think of it, the, the yeah. root of it, sex, sex is life. Sex is life force. What is sexy is when we are fully alive. And that means with all of us, that means our intellect is alive, our health is vibrant, our, um, all the pieces that make us up. It's funny when I draw a diagram of it, it actually looks like an, it looks like an anus. <laughs> Because I've drawn it with squiggle lines coming out from a center. On every squiggle line is a different aspect of me. If I try to hide all those aspects and just come forward with some isolated feature that I've decided, oh, this is my, oh, my butt is my good feature. I'm going to get a shot of it just right and that's going to be really sexy. No, that's just going to be this one isolated bit of you. Uh -huh. Show me all of you. Be wow. turned on with every cell. Let me see your humor. Let me see your wit. Let me see your desires. That's sexy when, when we're not hiding anything except what we genuinely wish to for us. Awesome. And I got a big question for you. Because okay. Most okay. of the women I talk to have okay. at least one body part that they hate. And that doesn't. I know. I and mean, it doesn't matter how beautiful, how young, it doesn't matter. I know. I've never met a woman and I watch TED Talks where models are talking about, I hate my body. So how do you get women in your classes to go <laughs> to work past what most women uh, suffer from, which yeah. is either some combination of body dysmorphia, eating yeah. disorder, or at yeah. least some kind yeah. of internalized hatred of the body. Oh, yeah. that um, what it, how I do is I don't make that the focal point of what we're doing. Again, yeah. these things become happy byproducts of a larger goal. So I'm not, I don't get someone in front of me and, and said, okay, we, we're going to get you to love your underarm. You know, <laughs> it just happens. It happens, but it oh. genuinely happens when, when we, and the, I, the name of my work is Showgirl Awakening. We are literally awakening mm. the part of us that is our most human and our most divine at once. It is the most alive aspect that can live in a body. And from that place, it's way beyond words. When we're there, um, it's that those that whole, the stance of, I don't like this part of my body or whatever, or, you know, not eating. I've, I, I have terrible time with eating disorders in my, in my youth. Um, yeah. That self-hatred, yeah. and, you know, bless our younger selves. We send them a kiss so hard. Huh. Um, yeah. Different questions oh. arise. Yeah, we hold them. We hold them. A little Veronica and little Kel. Yeah. <laughs> It, they that. feel it. They feel it. You know, yeah. it went back yeah. there. But the questions just become different when you start to have a felt sense of you 
this is why using the body, we get to work with felt sense. Felt sense is a lot closer to reality than words are. Mm -hmm. Words are a tertiary experience of reality. There's mm -hmm. reality, then there's awareness of reality, one step away, and then there's language put to our awareness of our reality. But on the level of experience, when we have the felt sense of being alive and being seen as us, it changes all the questions. It changes the frames through which we see ourselves. Mm. We, and it brings us into more of our right brain. The left brain decides, I like my butt, I don't like my arms. The left brain. The right brain is in awe that we are spirit in flesh. Period. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow, Kaleida, that's very profound. <laughs> In awe of the fact that we are spirit in flesh. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was talking with a friend yesterday about dance, particularly erotic dance. Yes. And I was thinking about the ancient sacred temples um, that I've read about online, where dance was an in integral part of that. Yeah. And and, and it felt to me, like when I read about those, of course, you know, I don't know exactly how accurate the history is on that because it really does go back so far. Yes, sir. But my general impression of it is that it's, it's really a divine feminine power, uh, an expression of that, and, and that we lost that in our um, patriarchal culture. Yeah. That, yeah. That, that sensuality was suspect, um, and it was constrained and contained and then kind of co-opted. Sorry for the alliteration, but I love yeah. alliteration. Um, <laughs> and, and that, so now when, when we as uh, uh, in, in, you know, a female body are trying to reconnect with that, yeah. it, it feels like we have to get through some of the, the fear of Absolutely. being um, seen as uh, too um, sexual. So, I think absolutely. Yeah. And, and of course, that's, you know, I'm all about trying to get people past sexual shame. That's why I'm the shame. Yeah, free zone. Yeah. But I'm just, I'm just curious, do you, do you bump into that with your clients? Um, or do they have difficulty yeah. sometimes feeling free enough to express their sensuality? I think this may be a little bit of a, a re-saying what I've already said, but um, but I'm also not wanting to forget something because something you said sparked something here. Okay. Ooh, I hope that train didn't leave the station. Anyway, I'll, okay. I'll start with the answer. Um, because, oh no, no, I caught it. It's the sexy okay. thing. Again, it's our, I think that the way in which sexy has become commodified, it literally has a price tag and like oh we like this kind of body this kind of face it's actually we've come to associate it with sexy but it's it's so decided on from the outside that it is not powerful it may it may have a currency in our culture but real the power associated with sexiness is not about looking a certain way it is a felt sense. It is raw power. It is the power to create life. Uh. It is actually, um, it can be a little scary and startling. That level of power that only comes through a woman's body. Uh. It's the power oh. To, oh. to make and take life. Oh, 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 oh. So <laughs> I really think that the whole thing, and that's just something to hold up, but it's made you think of something. Oh, I just, no, I, I, I guess I was a little confused. I totally get the female body creates life. Yeah. Um, I often think about the womb as this portal to the other side, in fact, that this yeah. is where the, you know, the spirit comes through women's yeah. wombs. Yeah. And, and that means it's like, you know, when you read about uh, in in sacred texts, they talk about the holy of holies. I'm like, that is the holy of holies. Oh yeah, there is. There's nothing more holy than this portal through which life comes. Yeah. And yes, it takes a sperm and an egg, but where does the spirit come from? And I always, I always think that that part of a woman is, it's, it's so um, sacred. 
And yeah. it's something that we as women have to be very respectful of how we touch into that part of our body too. Yes. And of course I am talking about cisgender women here. So um, what I am wondering is when you said to take life, I, and I threw yeah, me a little I'm also bit. wondering about that too, but it felt very true when I said it. Um, okay. Yeah. I let what comes through. I, I, I a little bit channel during these kinds of conversations. I love that you do that. Maybe the goddess Kali was trying to get a word in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I <laughs> think Kali I, is about death. Yeah, there is a way. Um, and this isn't, I don't mean that only women can be death doulas. Of course, people of any gender, or any genitalia, or any identity can. Sure. It feels like, you know, I've never given birth with my body. So I, I had the possibility to, I didn't do it, but I do somehow, um, I feel that they come, they come in, in, in tandem, this uh, the giving and the taking of life. And I wish I could articulate it more. I clearly don't mean in the sense of, I hate to be so graphic, but uh, murdering anyone can. Right, uh, right, right, right. But I mean on the level that doesn't have to do with a weapon, that has to do just with, um, maybe I'm looking at death also a little metaphorically as every time a woman who is in her menstruating years does sure. not have a baby, that's a death. It is, and it's so death. is miscarriage. Yes, so, and so is miscarriage. Yeah, yeah, those are all deaths. Yeah, I, I uh, definitely, I, I experienced a miscarriage. And it's, you know, you feel the life come into you, and then you feel the life leave you. And it's, it's a powerful experience. I think when I'm, I love that you asked me that question about why, I think on the level of, the archetype of not having to do with the gender, man or woman, but the archetype of, of the feminine and the archetype of the masculine. In the feminine, it, because it's receptive, because it's concave, it, it, um, when we die, we need to be held by the earth or, you know, we literally, um, we lose our human shape and we, we literally get received by the earth. There's something uh -huh. that feels very, death feels very uh, feminine to me. Oh, right. So mother earth. Yeah. Mother. Yeah. 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 Your guides oh. helped you make that bridge jump there. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> when I know you asked me a question and then all that we've just talked about came from this other thing. <laughs> you remember the question. I had an answer to that too, but I can't go far that far back and find it. <laughs> oh, I, I understand. I understand. Uh, okay. and I, uh, and, 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 you know, I could tell when you and I get together, there's going to be a lot of um, <laughs> other, other energies in here with us. So, yeah. <laughs> so when I'm working with my clients, a lot of times things come through. And I don't know where they came from. And then after <laughs> I've delivered it, the client will say, thanks for the homework. And I'm like, whatever I said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it was, but that's great. <laughs> Glad it was something oh you can use. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Amazing. So I God, I want you back on the show for sure, Kalina. Oh yeah. We'd love to. <laughs> yeah. I I'm thinking um right now, probably it'd be good for me to ask you, are there any questions that I could have asked you that I didn't ask you Ooh. that you'd like to share? Um, maybe about collapsing and posturing and the um the reimagining of the whole alive and well archetypes of the diva and the vamp and that might be that oh yeah. please okay okay <laughs> let's, let's start with the diva and the vamp sure let's start with the diva and the vamp okay well, they happen um this is very funny because i what I teach on, sometimes it drops in for me in increments. And then I'll know, say, the title of a workshop or the heading for certain things. And then I won't know for a long time, well, what is the information? <laughs> this happened with the archetypes. I knew the names of the archetypes. And there are nine. And we'll look, the diva and the vamp are two of them. 
Okay. I even would put in workshops to say, and we'll talk about the diva and the vamp and the ingenue and the vixen. But I didn't know what to say. It was fuzzy. And then it was a man. It was a man. I love to give him props. Tad Hargrave of Marketing for Hippies. Um, yes, I've, I've actually done some of his coaching. I love that. I love that. <laughs> yes, I love Tad. Right. And I have two. And Small world. I was in a mentorship with him. And he was asking me these wonderful questions, which I was trying to squirm out of because it was hard work. And he said, how do people show up at your doorstep and how do they leave? Mm. Oh, he was making me write it all down. And as I filled in those columns, yeah. I realized, oh my gosh, this is, I mostly have worked with collapsing divas and collapsing vamps. And I will describe Okay. these columns describe the collapsing experience of all nine of the archetypes moving towards the alive and well. Okay. And I'll, I'll fill, fill in these, but just mad props to Tad. Um, Definitely. So most of these terms come from old Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Not all of them, but most of them. And in the old movies, we would usually see a... When I say collapsing, it really helps to use my body. Like, if, like literally, let your body, oh, anyone, if you're listening, oh, okay. if you're watching, just let oh. your body collapse. Oh, you can feel it, the felt sense, like your heart sinking in. Yeah, yeah. It's a shame, it's a shame place, yeah? Okay. So that's collapsing. And then I'm going to do with my body um, the other side, which is posturing. When we yeah. puff up like a peacock. Okay. We have a big posturer in the peacock. white house. Right. Big talk. So when we're collapsing, we're in shame. If there's anything wrong, it must be me. It must be on me. Doesn't matter if it's a typhoon in Taiwan. It's on me. I know I did it. <laughs> that's, that's extreme collapse. Extreme posturing is doesn't matter what went wrong. It's not me. It's you. It's all <laughs> blamey, blamey. But the alive and well spot for whatever the thing is, and I'll use the diva, for example, okay. each of these nine, um, the diva is uh, about, when our diva is alive and well, we take up our space. It's not, we're not taking someone else's space. We're taking every iota of our space. Mm. And when we are collapsing, when, we're, when our inner diva, and everyone has an inner diva, when she's collapsing, we refuse to take up our own space. It's usually because we're so afraid of the people posturing, who we see next to us, who are taking up their space and everyone else's. But our reaction to less than take up our own space is just as crippling as posturing. Either way, either way is terribly crippling. So I get the yeah. crippling aspect of collapsing because yeah. you've got a direct line to shame and yep. feeling responsible for everything. Yeah. But can you help us understand how posturing, which is incredibly popular in our culture and is actually worshipped in a lot of ways, it's, it's right. modeled as a, a, right. a desirable behavior. How is posturing crippling? It cuts off connection. There is no genuine connection because there's no connection to the self. Uh -huh. It doesn't matter how many acres or counties that person might purchase, how many mansions they might build, how many right. things or people they may own, honestly, right. if they don't have that connection to self. When we have connection to self, we automatically respect ourselves and others. They don't come separately. You can, uh -huh. say, it either, you can say it either way you want. From the collapsing point of view, you could say, if I just, I think it's simpler to say respect of self and respect of others is a single movement. You can't have one without the other. So from the collapsing point of view, I might think like, I'm really respecting all these other people by shrinking myself down to the size of an olive. No, you're uh, not. No, you're uh, not. It seems very innocent and very wonderful, but it's, this is the awful thing. It's also toxic. Okay. Posturing is toxic and collapsing is toxic. For a long time, I didn't at all understand the toxicity of collapse. Well, I have when to I, say this is a new concept for me. I, I really um, kind of taken aback. I'm like, okay, 
So yeah. the person who is kind of shy and self-effacing is actually um, creating disconnect with other people. Both, both are creating disconnect. And the person who is acting, you know, posturing and, and kind of keeping their defenses up, <clears throat> yeah. making sure that they look good at all expenses is also creating lack of con connection. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's in this third place. It's not even that it's in the middle. It's, it's just a different place. It's yeah. the clean expression. So for example, of the diva who her verb, if she has one verb, it's like the diva owns, the diva occupies. <laughs> she occupies her space, but it's not in reaction to anyone else. It's not against anyone else. Right. It's just... She's in the freaking center of herself and she expands out to all her edges. It's gorgeous. And it actually has nothing to do with comparing herself to anyone. That is something I am familiar with. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so is my little dog, actually. <laughs> How so? How so, Veronica? <laughs> oh, she just, she just knows that... She, she loves herself. She just yeah. loves herself. And so she, everything that she, her body does, whether it's peeing or, <laughs> you know, she's, she's proud of it all. I love that. I love that. <laughs> and you're describing now, because each, all of these, these nine archetypes, which again, everyone, regardless of gender or identity, yeah. has them within. When they're all running at an alive and well place, it's like, it feels really good to be human. Um. The bombshell is the one when she's alive and well, self-love. She loves all her parts. She loves the under the arm. She loves the tummy. She loves the thigh. She loves all her parts. So the bombshell when she's alive and well is radiating self-love. Oh, now that one seems a little out of range. I know it's interesting. I have actually created a quiz um, to determine which is your primary archetype. Diva and, for sure. <laughs> well, I can't wait for you to take it. We, we might put it down. We might put oh, the link I to it. I would love that. We'll definitely we'll put it at the bottom here. On I won't tell you what they're all about, but. Okay. Uh, all right. And, and I, I will take it and find out if I even have any bombshell in me because I'm thinking no. I, I, I would think that a lot of women would, could move into diva. She would be little. collapsing. She would be collapsing. Yeah. She's there. Oh. But, Oh, okay. Gotcha. Okay. So bombshell is collapsing. How most of the women that I coach would have a hard time getting to bombshell. Uh, how do you, so you get them there by movement. And by the mindset shift of actually training them to see others and for others to see them. It's uh -huh. a, a way of, uh, of actual, it's a training of how we see. Yeah. I think it's very hard to do alone. It's really helpful yeah, no, no. to do with others. I would think so. This might yeah. be a good time for you to tell the viewers actually what all your offerings are, because <laughs> I, I'm thinking that, you know, we're left brain or we're uh, right. No, left brain. Yes, yeah. I, can't, I can't exist with this, but we're left brain right now. And we're trying to describe something that's uh, maybe a little bit ineffable, a little bit a little. difficult actually yeah. to put into words. I agree. Um, I, I experienced the same difficulty when I'm trying to uh, help people realize a sec a sacred sexual journey. Yeah, it's, just, it's, it's ineffable. It, there are not words in the culture to actually describe it. So it becomes something you just have to go through the homework and then you'll have an experience of it yourself. So I'm thinking your work is probably like that. I, yeah, it's, it's felt sense. It's something hard to describe, but when you experience it, you go, oh my gosh, okay, that's what you were talking about. Yeah. 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 Um, a, a good entry point is to come to an intro workshop uh -huh. and that's online. It's three hours online. Um, and I can drop a link in the bottom, but yeah. I don't know when someone's listening, but um, there's one on September 16th of 2020 um, in the daytime. So and it's just going to be evergreen. So um, wonderful. Uh, we'll have an evergreen link below for, totally. for a workshop. 
Yeah. And that's a really fine place to start. And taking the Showgirl Awakening Archetype Quiz is also a really fine way to start. Showgirl, Showgirl Awakening Archetype Quiz. And and the, yep, exactly. I'm, I'm going to take that as soon as we, okay. as soon as we end the interview. <laughs> I'm taking that. <laughs> hey, that's wonderful. That's okay. wonderful. Um, and a signature program I have is called Burlesque from the Inside Out. And that's that's a you know, a small cohort that I'm with for, you know, 10 to 12 weeks and create and perform. I really like to call this, this, this phrase came out the other day, how I approach burlesque. It's very much like soul retrieval performance art. Oh, oh my God. Soul retrieval performance art. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that kind of points to what I was talking about, that I, <laughs> I think some of us actually have some past life memories of, yeah. of sensual dancing. Yes. And, and so um, connecting with that is, yeah. uh, as I was talking about it with my friend yesterday, I was saying not so much learning as remembering. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, but, but unlearning that yes. now we won't be, killed for i mean there are parts of the world still today where you could exactly but but, but exactly. to to know that it's possible to do it in a safe way yes and that safe and, on all levels safe on all levels yeah and, and to um to free ourselves of that fear to be free of fear yeah yeah oh my god you are such a juicy interview Oh, yay! You're an interviewer. <laughs> <laughs> really enjoyed having you in the Shame Free Zone, Kalita. And uh, we are going to post all of those resources Amazing. at the bottom of this and, and definitely have you back. Thank you so, so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>